everybody, this is Liz from Augusta, and I have someone today that I'm very excited for you to get to meet and get to know from Augusta Nation. And I'm going to start out by letting him introduce himself and where he's from. Hey, good morning. Uh, my name is Matt Helmke. I am originally from Iowa, um, joined the military, and um, I ended up out here in North Carolina. And uh, so let's, I joined Augusta about a year ago and um, started the Hope Mills um, Augusta franchise. And where uh, if you were want me going you... any deeper? No, yeah, I will. I'll ask you okay. questions <laughs> out of you. So you were born in Iowa, and did you have brothers and sisters? Your parents were together? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I was the youngest of three. I have an older sister, eight years older than me, and then my brother's four years. Um, and then, yeah, parents were together, you know, throughout my childhood, had the uh, all-American childhood. No, You know, everything was always provided. Uh, parents were, you know, middle class, but um, I wouldn't have known it. You know, they made sure that I'd lack for nothing. And I appreciate that more and more as I'm a parent myself and realize kind of what uh, some of the sacrifices that they made. Yeah, that's for sure. Was your mm -hmm. dad in the military? He wasn't. No, um, my uh, my uncles were and my grandfather was in World War II um, and he lost his leg in France. So um, he was kind of a a bigger figure in my, in my childhood. I was always around him. So that maybe kind of pushed me towards uh, joining. Yeah. So when you would listen to your uncles and your grandpa talk, was that something that um, excited you and made you want to do it? Like from a little kid there, it's no brainer. This is what I want to do. Right. Yeah. No, it, it was definitely, uh, definitely interesting. And, you know, I always, you know, ask uh, my grandpa questions probably that were inappropriate, but um, you know, I didn't know any better. And, and he entertained entertained me so as well as my uncles um and i wouldn't say that i was set to join the military throughout my life you know i, I kind of it was you know important but uh I, I did a lot of sports and stuff so i wanted to play sports and i wanted to go to college first um so it's kind of the path i took was i mm -hmm. went to college and then um my junior year of college i just i did the uh, delayed entry program where you get to yeah. finish college but you still um once you graduate uh you go to military. So it was kind of nice. So was it expected from your family that you would go to college or were you just a good student and wanted to do that? <laughs> uh, I guess it, it was kind of, I'm caught up in that generation where it was expected if you could go to college, you, like everybody has to go, which I don't think is the case now. Um, and I wasn't the first of the family to go, but you know, um, that was just kind of the stepping, what I had put out in my life was like, I need to go to college, do this. Um, and I think part of it was I didn't exactly have uh, all my ducks in a row. And it was more mm -hmm. of a, a time to do a little soul searching. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Yeah. And then what did you go to college for? So initially, uh, I went to a two-year um, uh, school and I got my associates in criminal justice. I wanted to be in law enforcement. Um, so then I, I transferred to a four-year school, University of Northern Iowa. And I was in criminology and... Um, I did a little more uh, extracurricular activities than I probably should have and uh, <laughs> ended up switching my major to something easier so I could actually graduate uh, in a relative uh, period of time. So I, I graduated with an associate's in or a bachelor's in political science, which is not really a whole lot you can do with that. Uh, yeah. So, <laughs> But you did it. So there yep. you go. Yep. Yep. So what was the thing that made you go into the military to make that decision? Um, when I was a uh, senior in high school, my, my buddy and I, went, we went with a recruiter out for lunch and, you know, I was really interested in it, but um, I wanted to play sports in college. So um, I was like, well, I'm going to do this, you know, and, and I played for a year and it didn't really work out. Um, I guess I wasn't into it as into it as I should have been. Um, so my junior year, I was at the university and, you know, it was 2003 is when I did the delayed entry. And that was, you know, a few years into um, after 9-11 and all that. Mm -hmm. and I can't say that 9-11 was alone, like what made me want to do it. But I think more or less a sense of adventure and like, I don't know if I thought I had to prove something, you know, yeah. I always kind of had a little bit of a chip on my shoulder as far as not 
necessarily thinking that I've done enough or, um, mm -hmm. so I think it was just a, an answer to, you know what, I don't have it figured out. So I'm going to go do this. Yeah. So, um, what did you do at the beginning? You, you joined, which branch of the military were you in? Sure. I, I joined the army and I was a, you know, I, an infantryman, um, that's what I was told, you know, we got to be an infantryman, you know, this and that, but, um, you know, it's not always the most glorious, uh, position. So yeah. I didn't, uh, my uncle was always on me. He was like, when are you going to go be a warrant officer? Well, I, I didn't do that. Um, I could have, cause I was in, I went to college, but, right. um, I wasn't enlisted, came in as a, a specialist. So, um, so joined the army and went to training, basic training down in Georgia, uh, graduated after like 16 weeks. And then, I got recruited to my first duty station, which was the old guard because I'm tall. So I don't know if any, if you know much about them, but they're the ones um, in Washington, DC that do the, uh, all the ceremonies for like the president they go to the white house and stand there just because they're tall and, and uh, they do the tomb of the unknown, but I, I didn't do that. I wasn't there long enough. So I'm not taking credit for that. Um, and then about so six months into my first duty station, I realized that that was a terrible place for, somebody who was out looking to, you know, get some action. Mm -hmm. um, so I went to special forces selection. Um, I get, went there and went through the selection process and I got picked up. So I went back to my first duty station in Washington, DC, finished my year there because you had to be there a year. Um, and then uh, transferred to Fort Bragg, North Carolina. And uh, I've luckily been in, at Fort Bragg the rest of my career. So um, that was 2007. So I, I've um, been stationed at Fort Bragg for a long time, which is unusual in the military. So you said special forces. When you go to get into special forces, do they give you an option of the different ones? Or do you say, I, I want to be a Green Beret or I want to be this or that? Do you tell them up front or do they kind of see where they would position you? Sure. So um, I know it's, it's confusing because special forces is a pretty broad term. Yeah. Um, so Army Special Forces. Um which is the Green Berets, um, U.S. Army Special Forces Green Berets. So that's that was the option that I had. There's also Rangers and stuff, but um, that that wasn't my path, I guess. Um, so Army Special Forces was the the path for me. So if I was the Navy, it would be you know Navy SEALs or whatever that you know. But that's just the Army path. I see. Okay, so when you say Green Beret, it's it's Army. Correct. Okay, got it. And and what does the Green Beret typically do? What makes them special forces? Are they given more responsibility or more secret, higher level responsibility? Yeah, so um, the U.S. Army Special Forces are the only ones designated by Congress to be um, to con conduct unconventional warfare. Okay. Um, so basically, uh, you know, we go into a country, um, maybe not, you know, overtly and we we link up we can link up with people and you know um help other armies do stuff um it's more low-key um lower conflict so they're trying to prevent full-scale conflict um so that's why they would send uh we operate in 12-man teams so okay. you can send a 12-man team um somewhere to train up x y and z in, in this country and um it's a lot more bang for your buck and it's, you know, it's under the radar for the most part. Um, so unconventional warfare, um, you know, we can do direct action, all the cool stuff, but if you get down to it, our, our job is unconventional warfare. Um, and we're, we're instructors basically, but we do get trained in in everything else. But if you beat it down to the, you know, bare bones, that's what we're supposed to be conducting unconventional warfare mm -hmm. in a so denied env environment. Okay. And when you were in the army, did you get any live action on the field? Yeah. I, um, once I got to a team, um, I started deploying right away. Um, so I, I came in, there's different MOSs, which the army calls jobs. So, uh, my first job, I was a, uh, 18 echo, which is the communication sergeant on the team. There's out of the 12 man team, everybody has some sort of specialty and that allows you to deploy and basically be self-sufficient you can, you know, operate the 12 of you, your, your jobs co-mingle and, and you should be able to, to provide everything. So I was at 18 echo communication. So basically we hit the ground. I was in charge of making sure we were getting our satellite shots back, um, being able to talk, stuff like that. 
And then, uh, so as a young 18 Echo, we went on to have started going to Afghanistan, um, done three tours to Afghanistan and then various other locations. Um, the last time I was deployed, I, I had a team of my own and I went to Africa. So I spent a little, a little over two years total in Afghanistan. Um, and then we've done other training missions all over the place. So, yeah, are a lot of them secret for the Green Berets? Um, I mean, I don't, they're sensitive. Mm -hmm. um, you don't, you know, um, when you go there, you're not, you know, it's not overt what you're, you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. um, there was definitely, definitely missions that hit, we didn't wear U.S. uniforms. We blended mm -hmm. in with like um, foreign nationals of the other country. Um, and, uh, you know, kind of looking back, it was some definitely some hairy situations that um, I thought was cool then. And then now uh, fast forward with uh, three kids and a wife, I'm like, oh, that, that could have gone horribly wrong. Yes. Yes. So um, the timeline there, how long were you in the military and did you uh, retire there? Yeah. So I'm still active duty I okay. am at 19 years. So um, I am retiring at my 20 year mark. And that allows me to have my pension and all that. So um, I'm <clears throat> in the process of, of getting out and uh, just getting all my ducks in a row as far as, you know, um, the medical stuff, all the injuries and stuff you have to uh, have documented. And I've had quite a few. So my body's probably like a 60 year old man right now and I'm 42. So, <laughs> wow. but it's all, it's all part of it. So I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't trade it. Yeah. You weren't, you weren't built for an office job. <laughs> no, no. I'm actually doing an <laughs> office job right now for him and it's horrible. <laughs> well, hopefully just for a minute. Right. Yeah. Well, it'll, it'll be a good thing uh, going forward. At least if your body feels beat up, you'll have a little long-term <laughs> something going on here, but we'll get to that. So did you yep. get married before you went into the military? Uh, no. So I, um, I got married in 2009. I joined the military in 2005. So, um, I had just gotten to special forces and, um, met my wife. And, um, so my first two years of marriage, I was pretty much gone the entire time. So yeah. Yeah. Well, she's a very strong, independent, uh, woman. So, you know, I, I was not worried, but and she took care of everything. And then uh, yeah. we had our first child in 2013. So it, you know, we'd been married a little bit and I'd been on plane deployments. So it wasn't as terrible as some of the guys have children. Yeah. Um, and they, they miss a lot of the time. Yeah. So how old are your kids now? And are they boys, girls? So I have two girls and a boy. The oldest girl is 11. Uh, the middle is eight. And then my son is six. Yeah. So he got to be the caboose just like you did. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. That's great. So, so you've, you're almost retired. Uh, but when you started to hear about Augusta, how did you first, how did it first come to your attention? Yeah. So um, I guess uh, trying to transition to this it was about three years ago and I, I had worked my way up on special forces to like kind of the apex where um, I got promoted to pretty much there wasn't anywhere else for me to go. I had my own uh, 12 man team um, for two years and uh, it kind of, um, at the end of that two years, I was pretty wore out um, and I was ready for a transition, but it was just kind of hard to, to figure out how that was going to work. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it, it worked mysterious ways, but uh, long story short, I ended up um, starting my own um, lawn care business okay. uh, on the side. And then okay. um, it, it was very small, uh, chuck in the truck type of stuff. So um, and then through when I was doing that, I was um, searching the web for information and just came across uh, Mike Andes and the Augusta, Augusta Nation on there. And it just, you know, I started following um, and just, you know, consuming the material. Mm -hmm. um, when when it was years ago, Mike used to make videos that were so rudimentary uh, but he started to give the free content out to people and he would let people from all industries call in and he would answer their questions. And he would get calls from guys in the military that were planning their exit and wanted mm -hmm. to have a plan when they came out. 
But were you home? Were you home enough to be able to start this business? Or what did you do when you were gone? Yeah, so um, I had, had pretty much hit the point where um, I got out of being a team leader. Um, and then I was in a position where I was pretty much an office guy. And I knew that for, you know, I probably wasn't going to be deploying. So okay. if I had been deploying, it would have been impossible to, mm -hmm. to do it. Yeah. Um, so I was, I was comfortable enough to know that it wasn't in the cards for me to start mm -hmm. deploying or anything like that. I mean, it's still a possibility, but it was, it was very unlikely. Um, so that gave me the sense of, you know, that I could start, start doing it. Yeah. Okay. That's awesome. And your wife was supportive of you having that on the side and you're still getting your military pay. So, um, yeah. 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 She's very supportive. I know it, at first she was like, why are you doing this? Um, cause I was gone out when I wasn't at work doing the military, I was out cutting grass and, yeah, um, you know, and I think once I joined Augusta, she, she started to see the whole plan. Um, mm -hmm. and then she, she came with us to con came with me to conference. Nice. Um, and, I, and that definitely was, uh, you know, where it all kind of came together and she's a, a lot more understanding, um, yeah. of the time that it takes right now. Yeah. So when you were first starting your lawn care business, you were looking around online just for tips and tricks and just, uh, information to run the business, right? Exactly. Yeah. So probably from multiple streams, even besides Mike. Yeah, it was the all the regular ones out there, you know, I hit a search button for lawn care on, yeah. and, and they and then they all come up. So some of them good, some of them not so good. I definitely, um, you know, took some of the bad information and did, you know, things that I probably would have yeah. done again, but that's the uh, part of the learning process. Definitely. So when you started listening to Mike, was that just... Um, I guess that would have been pretty, pretty near to now. So it would have been pretty mature and mostly him just talking at his whiteboard, right? Giving a lot of information. Exactly. It, it was a lot of the, the, you know, like it was a little over two years ago. So when he had, you know, started producing more of the, um, the videos, uh, how to stuff on the whiteboard. Yeah. Um, and that definitely gave me some insight as far as to, what I really needed to do. And I appreciated the fact that he just off at the beginning, he just seemed like a type of person that, that I trusted. Yeah. Um, you know, he didn't come across as, um, he wasn't looking to get anything from me. Like there was, there was anything that, you know, he was going to benefit from me, um, consuming his, his information. So I could kind of sense that. Yeah. And probably from your, your history of your employment, you're probably pretty sharp at, uh, picking up, BS from people. Yeah, it's definitely a part of the job. And, and you know, to my detriment, sometimes I, I tend to judge people um, before I should. But yeah, know, a lot of the yeah. time I'm right. <laughs> Unfortunately. That makes sense. Yeah. So him doing all of that and doing it free just because he cared probably really vet him in your eyes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So you started listening to him. You're mowing your lawns. How many lawns did you have? Uh, so the first year I had, uh, I think, 10 or 11. And that mm -hmm. was, I started it at a terrible time. It was July. Um, oh, my. <laughs> now I know that that's not the right time to do it after yes. watching Mike's content. Um, it was July. And I was just going door to door. And just, you know, I just talked a few people into it. And then, you know, they know somebody. Um, but looking back, nothing against the clients, but it wasn't my target neighborhood where I should have been, mm -hmm. um, where I should have been looking for clients. So I don't think I have any in that area anymore. Um, so the first year I had about 11, the second year, um, maybe 20. And then, um, this year we're up to 72. So Awesome. Um, yeah. So a lot of people would ask you, like, why, why lawn care when you could have gone into multiple directions? You could have even used your degree. Was it the barrier to entry was so small or did you did you mow grass when you were a kid and you were good at it? Yeah. So I did uh, mow grass when I was younger. Um, I think my grandpa I mowed his was the first. And I don't recall exactly how old I was, but my brother and I would mow it every week and we would get, each get seven, seven dollars and fifty cents. Wow. Which to me was a lot of money then. Yeah. He probably, over, he probably overpaid us. Um, and then, you know, in high school, I had probably six or seven 
um, people around the town. I was in a small town and, you know, I'd borrow my dad's trailer and, you know, push him over and go out and do it. Um, but to answer the question as far as why lawn care, I guess I've always been kind of drawn to it. You know, I always enjoy it. Um, I always took really good care of my yard and I would, I'd be out there all the time. Um, and I, I just, the barrier entry is, is lower. And mm -hmm. I like the fact that your success can be, um, depends on how hard you want to work. Yes. I like that because, you know, I can be hard headed and if I want something, I, you know, kind of go all in mm -hmm. and, and I didn't have a lot of money to put towards it. So, but I understood that if I worked hard at it, I could, you know, build it and, and just, you know, make it more profitable. What did you implement from first watching Mike's content? Oh, let's see here. Um, I would say um, probably some of the sales stuff um, as far as um, if, you know, trying to um, charge what you're worth, um, that was a huge problem for me. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I didn't have as much confidence in my, didn't know my worth. Yeah. Um, and, and I didn't really know how to measure it either. So mm -hmm. um, after watching some of his stuff, it helped me. It gave me a bit of a measuring tool, say, if you say, um, to uh, kind of figure out what I need to charge. And then if I want to, to, to be at this position, then I need to do this, this, and this. So that, that absolutely helped, helped me grow. Mm -hmm. As you, as you heard him talk about the franchise, what did you think it was that made you think you even needed to be a part of that? <clears throat> yeah. So, um, it's kind of funny and I talked about it at training, but, um, I was watching some of his material and I don't know exactly what he said, but it was to the, to the effect of, um, the way that the Augusta is changing the industry was going to everybody else is either going to have to get on board to change how they do stuff or mm -hmm. they're going to be more or less obsolete. Um, it wasn't in those exact words, but yeah. it was, it was down, down that, that line. And that kind of rubbed me the wrong way. I was like, who's this guy? I think yeah. he is, you know? And I don't know. I probably took a break from watching it for maybe a month or two. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I guess once, um, I don't know, once I got back into it, um, I had wrestled with, with joining Augusta because, um, you know, as a solo entrepreneur, I had my own my own company. It was an LLC. It was doing okay. Mm -hmm. um, but it was kind of lonely. Yeah. Like, uh, I felt like I was out on an island by myself. Mm -hmm. um, and I knew what I needed to do, but it was really punching up uphill. And I just saw the value in, in being part of Augusta as far as just the brotherhood and, you know, there's so many resources that people don't even know about. Um, and, and it really, it gave me a, a sense of, I can do this, you know, here's, you know, a little bit more support. Um, and then the fact that there is um, basically a how to um, by steps of um, how to be successful in Augusta. Um, and if you're, you know, he even has all of the steps lined up and put it spelled out. Like if you're at this step, this is what you're going to feel. This is what yeah. you're going to do. Um, and you can always go back to that. Um, and I, for me, that was just a, a more of a comfort thing. So to answer the question, I felt, you know, kind of out on my own and really um, just wanted to be part of something um, and just saw the value in, in the Augusta brand. Did your wife hear any of the content while you were around about home or whatever, or did you just listen to it in your truck by yourself? No, I didn't really uh, listen to it at home. Um, it was pretty much just when I was out mowing or um, watching some YouTube videos before I went to bed. Yeah. So she had, she had no idea kind of who Mike was or what was going on. And then when you presented this about the franchise, she probably was like, what in the world? <laughs> Yeah, it's um, when I get stuff stuck in my head, I'm kind of set. I'm going to do it. 
and I'd already made up my mind that I was going to do it, but I still had to, you know, run it by her. Yeah. Um, and I think I just pulled up some YouTube videos and, you know, she's like, oh, okay. <laughs> if you, if you think that's what you want to do, <laughs> you know, um, so, you know, she's, she's, uh, she works too. So it's, you know, not like, she, you know, I know she's going to have to sacrifice as well. Yeah. Um, she has a full-time job and the kids and, um, but that's part of the pitch was that, Hey, you won't have to work anymore. You can work for me and, you know, do office stuff or whatever, you know, mm -hmm. so. Wow. That's, that's the goal. That was the goal. Is that, is that okay with her? Is she, is she happy to do that? Yeah. She, uh, you know, is more than happy to change, change jobs and, and uh, be more of a stay at home mom. She mm -hmm. really enjoys that. So. That's great. So you decided to become a franchise and was that you talked to Lee and then you talked to your wife. Was that how the order went? Exactly. Yes. <laughs> and how was she with the fact that you had to pay so much up front? Um, <clears throat> she was a little bit concerned, but mm -hmm. um, I had done a pretty good job rehearsing in my mind, you know, and the, a lot is relative as far as, um, I think what you get for it, um, yeah. you know, cause they have the military discount for that, which I helped out. Um, so it was like $15,000, but in the grand scheme of things, you know, I could have spent that on a car or something. Right. Um, exactly. So yeah. I think it's, I, I had the investment side argument. Yeah. Okay. So your final decision was really based on you could do this yourself, but you would probably do better if you were with the community and had some support. Absolutely. And when you came for training, was that what you expected to come and meet others and uh, to be kind of overwhelmed with four days of training? Uh, yeah, I, I definitely, um, I mean, it was a little different than I expected. It was more, um, um, I don't know, like, more of a small, smaller environment. I kind of expected just in the military, you get like large groups of people and just get massive amounts of information thrown at you. And they don't, they expect like 5% to stick. Um, yeah. but the, the, uh, it was a small group environment. I think we had, I don't know, 15 of us total. Mm -hmm. Um, and the demographics was all over the chart. It wasn't any specific, um, you know, demographic, which I thought was cool. Um, and the, it was a lot of information, but I think Mike and you guys had done a great job of, of presenting the most important stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, the booklets and stuff that we got, you know, were helpful. So when you left there, um, what happens after that? Do you typically have a call with somebody from command center to get your account set up? And were you in co-pilot at that time or did you go into service autopilot? Yeah, so after that, I, I, I went last, um, it would have been the end of July for the training. Oh, okay. And then um, I came back, and then after I got home, there was a, you know, command center called. Um, they gave me some homework to do as far as, like, what you need to do to set everything up. And they pretty much did everything. I had a quick uh, conference with them and just talked about how they wanted stuff set up. And I was the first cohort to go straight to Copilot. Wow. Um, so I luckily didn't have to do the, the service autopilot. I don't know if I can yes. say that, but um, I've heard horror stories. So <laughs> I was I was on a different um, program, a little smaller um, that I had used, which was okay. You know, it got the job done. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, th but coming into co-pilot was all new for you too. And here we are trying to cram all the, the good that was in service autopilot and cram it into co-pilot. So here we go. Yeah, it's, it's, um, you know, a lot of people talk online and some good, some bad, you know, but I think, um, from what I've seen, it's, it's moving in the right direction and it's a huge help for me. Like I couldn't, I couldn't imagine doing what I'm doing without having co-pilot. Yeah. So when you came back from training, you had 70 lawns, you said? No, that's this year. So I had, um, probably 25, 30. Okay. And what were the first steps when you came back? Um, did he tell you how to do marketing to give you like a list of things to do to get started? Um, trying to, so I think it was, um, 
yeah, just working on like how to, how to brand yourself, the transition to Augusta branding, um, you know, the, the exact steps on what we need to do. There was no, um, you know, everything was spelled out pretty much. I didn't, there was no guessing on what I needed to do. And if I did need anything, there was, um, I could just pick up the phone or, or text somebody Yeah. as far as the next steps. That's good. So this is your year into it. So is this your first spring? Yeah, this is my first uh, spring as an official Augusta nation. So. Okay. And you're by yourself. I am. Yeah. I have um, a few people that if I get really down in the weeds uh, due to weather that they'll come help me out. Um, and that that's been a tremendous help. Uh, 70s, maybe a little bit um, for one person. Yeah. But it's all self-inflicted. So, um, <laughs> and luckily my, my dad, when he, he's retired recently and him and my mom, they drive out in their camper and they, I got a place in my backyard where they can park it and hook up everything. And they come out and stay for a couple of weeks at a time and, and dad enjoys it. So I'll throw him on a mower and he just goes to town all day. Um, Sweet. So they're actually on their way out. Uh, and he's going to, you know, give me a little boost for the, the spring rush. So Nice. So when it rains there, is it raining so hard that you can't mow? Yeah, when it rains out here, it's just impossible. Um, your debt gets so crammed up with, with um, stuff. So, um, and then usually, you know, you, after it rains, like the next day you can still mow, but there's a lot of, um, a lot of soft spots. You got to be very careful just because of the soil composition. Yeah. Are you on weekly or do you do some customers bi-weekly also? So the way it is out here, uh, the majority of them are bi-weekly, mm. uh, which I know people don't like, but I have a few that are weekly. And, and honestly, the way the grass grows out here, it's like weekly, you, it's, oh, you almost don't need it. Like it, bi-weekly is about perfect. Um, so, so you I'll wouldn't just, be able to sell anybody by saying we only offer weekly. That wouldn't really work in your area. I don't think it worked well at all. Um, you know, I, I'd probably lose quite a bit of clients just because it's not, you know, there's an, everybody else out here does the biweekly. So I'm sure they would just get with somebody else. Mm -hmm. How tight are your routes? So that's like 30, 35 a week. Are they in the same yeah. neighborhoods or do you have to drive pretty far? Yeah. So that's one of the first things that um, listening to Mike and, and all the content I tightened up was my route. Yeah. Um, the first year when I was doing it, I had no idea what I was doing. I was all over the place. Um, and that was terrible. So the second year I got better. And then this year it's been great. And when I did market, mm -hmm. I marketed in the neighborhoods I was already in and people had already seen my truck and stuff around. Um, I did the uh, instant quote door hangers and nice. they have been amazing. Um, so I added, oh, was it like 28 people since the end of February? Oh and my was, goodness. Yeah. And I only put out 1500 door hangers incredible yeah so it's 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 ridiculous and they're all mostly in the same exact neighborhoods i love it yeah it's great yeah and then probably some of those people are seeing other people have you there and it's just like you're taking over i'm actually probably turning down five to six people a week as because i can't i can't take anymore so wow so at what it, point are you going to hire somebody i need to do it right now um and I've kind of thought about it, but I, I don't want to have to do my army job and then have to worry about, you know, making sure somebody's doing what they're supposed to do and, and train them up properly. Yeah. Um, I want to be able to give it like a hundred percent of my attention and do it right. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm thinking next spring, I'm going to buy another truck and then, and then hire my first, um, my first person. And then, um, I'll be free and clear and I should be able to, to just grow like mad. Yeah. I wonder if you'll actually have some people come to you and ask for a job. Yeah. So with the Augusta, um, name getting out there and then I've gotten several, um, job applications through the website and they, they had the resumes on there, which is cool that, that the, uh, website does all that for you. It takes all their information um, and they emailed me the resume and they were from the large competitors in the area. Yeah. So their resume, they'd worked at those locations for a period of time. So I think once the word gets out about P4P and all that, it's, it's mm -hmm. not going to be a problem getting 
quality uh, people. Yeah. So they're all listening, a lot of them probably listening to Mike's content to try to get better at their jobs and maybe own their own someday. And then they're seeing here's somebody right here that I could learn from and work for. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I know his, I've had so many people stop me and say, Hey, you know, you know, Mike Annie's. So I'm like, I, we're not like best friends. I've met him a few times. <laughs> Like you want that's, my autograph? <laughs> yeah, that's great. That's good. And so you you haven't offered anybody a job just because it would be too much to manage a person. Exactly. Yeah. So the, the jobs you're turning down, what are you saying to them? Um, basically, hey, you know, at this time, our route in your area is full. Um, we aren't taking any more people on. You can check back later. That's and I good. always... I always give them an option. I know I learned this was to give them here. Maybe you should try and call this person, mm -hmm. a different company. And I've actually had a relationship with a couple of the smaller guys around in my area. I'm like, Hey, you know, can I send people your way? I'm like, absolutely. So, um, so you're I creating guess. a pretty solid name for yourself with a good reputation of just, uh, you know, camaraderie in the community. Right. Yeah. That's great. Uh, so you've been a year and how has it been for you? Does, does it meet your expectations in the fact that um, there is an Augusta community and support? Absolutely. Um, I think I'm more uh, as beat my expectations. Um, the, the community is, is amazing. Um, I know we have the Facebook group and then we have the, the co-pilot Facebook group. Um, there's, you know, the command center, you can text them and stuff. It's just, it's over, over the top as far as um, communication wise. There's been several times where as a newer individual, I put on the Facebook chat, Hey, this is what's going on. What should I do? And within a couple of minutes, some of the older guys that are more experienced, like you need to do this, this or whatever. Um, so it just, it feels good to have that reach back. Yeah, for sure. Cause if you, if you didn't have Augusta, you would be dinking around online and trying to find the answer or just trying to wing it yourself with YouTube. Yeah, definitely. I've, I've done that. <laughs> so. Yeah. So you came to conference with your wife. What did she think when she came? Um, she was impressed. Absolutely impressed. Um, as far as the amount of people and then, um, as far as the content, um, that, that Mike had lined up and you had lined up, um, she, enjoyed sitting in on the, the different speakers and stuff. And, you know, she could take some of the value and apply it to what her job too. It wasn't just strictly lawn care stuff. A lot mm -hmm. of it was just, you know, lessons as far as business or um, that can be applied in different areas. Yeah. What does she do for work? She works as um, a paralegal. She's the manager of a, a company that does real estate closings. Okay. Yeah. So she can definitely take some of the systems or things from there and implement them. Yep. That's great. Yeah. So, so since the conference, she's seen you uh, do what you're doing in the business. Has she become pretty supportive since then? Um, absolutely. It's, um, you know, every now and again, we'll have a heart to heart because, you know, I am gone so much and, you know, I, I try to say, Hey, we're, I appreciate you letting me work and taking care of the kids. Mm -hmm. um, for example, the last two weeks have been insane. I don't like to work on the weekend, but I've had so much stuff with weather, um, a few days of rain, mm -hmm. just get backed up and I, I you know, I overextend myself. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm working Saturday, I'm working all day today, um, by which I said I don't like to do, but she's had the kids all weekend and I've been popping in and out. Um, so she's supportive of that as long as yeah. I try to let her know that I'm appreciative um, of her, but you know, when she can quit her other job, I think she'll understand. <laughs> yeah, It'll be worth it then. Hopefully. Yes. So do you take all your own phone calls or do you have command do some of those things for you? Yeah. So command, um, they take all my calls. Um, they do the, uh, they take the call and then on my calendar, I'll get a notification. Hey, you have a to do. Um, so I just pop up my phone, look at my calendar and, and they take all the notes down and say, Hey, so-and-so called, um, they want you to do a look for a, a cleanup or that you, this person wants you to cut their grass, do a drive by and just give them a quote. So do you have on your website that you're not taking any more customers because here you are doing estimates? 
Yeah, I need to uh, put that on there. I just, I'm not sure. Maybe you can tell me if I should or not. <laughs> uh, some some guys do. They just say that they're not taking new clients or they're full okay. for right now. And they can put that on their website so that, you know, people can try back later. Yeah, I think a lot of it is the branding too. Just 100%. The truck, the truck looks amazing. Uh, I got my trailer. It looks great. Um, and you just, you can see people, it's a head turner. Yeah. Um, so I think people see that when I'm driving around and, and they just call the number on there and um, that's kind of how it is. So I don't know how many is actually going to the website, but I need to put a something on the trailer that says not taking any other customers. <laughs> or just leave it on there and, you know, they can keep calling, but it could be on your wiki or somewhere on your schedule to say that you're currently not taking any more clients. You could sit yeah. just say you're full for right now. Yeah, I might need to do that. Yeah. And then you can raise your prices again. That, that's another thing I've, you know, with watching Mike's content and just um, all the stuff he puts out, the, uh, the turnarounds he's been doing. Um, I saw that I was on the um, max mat matrix, whatever matrix, the, yeah. the monthly um, I was like number three for close rate. And I was like, Oh, that's not bad. That's not good. <laughs> Cause <you> know, <laughs> I'm getting too much work. <laughs> I, yeah, I'm, I need to raise my prices because if you're ranking high on there from what Mike says or, you know, it's like your prices are too low if you're at over 75% close ratio. So I was like, Ooh, I don't want to be up on that number three there. <laughs> yeah, so that might make your schedule more manageable with the same amount of money coming in. Yeah. Yeah. What is that board behind you? It looks very detailed. Oh, yeah. This is my... Um, well, it is the computer room slash playroom, TV room in the office. And um, I just have broken down by different neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. um, okay, there, that's how, how many? Yeah, it's like five or six different neighborhoods. And then these are all the new people right here. Wow. So, um, it, help, it just helps me. I'm a visual person. So I have all this on the app, but it just helps me to um, have eyes on it. I can sit there and stare at it sometimes and yeah, see visions. Yeah, see visions. <laughs> and is that um, you have one truck and one trailer? That's right. I have. Well, I have one truck. I have a enclosed trailer, and I have a uh, fourteen foot dump trailer. Okay. And then I have a debris loader for leaves and stuff. So that yeah. helps out a lot. So people that are listening will probably want to know what kind of services you're offering. Just starting out. Yeah. So um, I've learned through Mike's content and just you know talking to people is. Um, less is more. Um, so get good at a few things and then really stick to those. So, uh, for example, I do um, rich regular maintenance, um, mowing, um, cleanups, uh, do leaf removal. Uh, I, I was doing fertilization and weed control, and I recently just turned everybody I had over to another company. So I, I met nice. with somebody and it's like, hey, I trust you. Um, can you take over these for me? you know, I, I'm not into it and it's just one extra thing, uh, kind of distracting. So I'm just trying to stick to the basic maintenance stuff, um, mowing and cleanups and stuff like that. Mulch installs. We do a lot of that. So there's a lot of people that feel the very same way. They hate the weeding. They hate doing all those extra things. So if they wanted to do what you've done, do they put, do you put the, a referral of that person in your wiki? So if somebody calls for those services, they can recommend this other person. I haven't done that yet. I probably need to um, dig into that. And oh, so they just there. give them all to you and then you hand them off to that person. Yeah, no. So they're already current uh, customers that okay, I, okay. I do the fertilization and weed control for. And then finally I was like, Hey, I'm going to hand every, all of this off to, to this other company. So I can just focus on the maintenance part. Yeah, and how did your customers respond to that? Um, we'll see, because it just happened yeah. last week. So, um, But I, I think I have a pretty good relationship with a lot of my customers, so uh, I think they'll trust that I you know, did what I could to find a reliable um, substitute. Yeah, so they already trust you and have a good relationship with you. For the most part, yes. Yeah, so what's your one-year goal, your five-year goal, your big goal? Um. So my one year, I guess, is coming up on that. Um, I'd like to, uh, you know, I hit my numbers goal for low people. I guess I'd like to hit 150,000 
in revenue. Okay. Solo, which is, would be a, a huge plus for me and, and trying, what I'm basically doing is trying to stock his way, talk away as much cash as possible because yeah. as Mike says, you know, cash is like air when you're trying to grow, mm -hmm. um, you have to have it. So I'm, I'm trying to have a war chest to, um, once I next spring can, can hit, hit the, um, hit the bricks running. Um, so I guess that'd be a big goal for me. Um, and then in the next year and a half or next year, I'd you know, like to hire one more person and then get another truck. Um, and then I guess five years, I plan on opening multiple locations and, and completely dominating this part of North Carolina. How so far are you from another location? I think the closest location is Clayton, North Carolina, and that's almost an hour and a half away. Um, so you have Charlotte, enough space around you to get some more locations. Absolutely. Yeah. There's, and the, my population center is there's a ton of military people. There's a ton of military retirees and my County alone, the population is over like 350,000. Um, so, and I'm only in a few little neighborhoods. I just, I have a hard time. I drive by these names. I'm like, Oh, I gotta go there. You know? Yeah. Um, I have to kind of calm down a little bit. And, and, you know, even just if I get more of the neighborhoods I am in, it's, you know, it's going to be incredible. Yeah. So if you can get some of these guys in the military, it'd probably help them too, to have a plan when they come out to have a full-time job. Absolutely. Yeah. And they, the military actually has a program for people retiring. Um, and you can, uh, the last six months of your actual time, you can do an internship. Sweet. So I think, it, you know, if um, Mike or yourself got linked up, you have to get registered for it. Um, mm -hmm. And then you'll be on the list of companies that veterans. And so they basically work for you for six months for free. They can't get paid uh, because they're, they're getting paid their basic pay from the military. Mm -hmm. So it gives them a lot of hope then that they could actually do that and then eventually become an owner. Absolutely. Yeah. It's um, they would already have their six months in. Exactly. Yeah. It would be a, a huge, I think it would take off like wildfire as far as, you know, our community. Yeah. Yeah. And then you could have them be your GMs and be able to move on to open your other locations. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm, I'm definitely going to tap into some of the talent. There's a ton of talent and um, really smart people that know how to, you know, work. And, mm -hmm. and uh, so I don't know, I had one guy help me yesterday. He was a, a friend of a neighbor um, and he was a younger guy, but uh, he, he, I don't know, we were about three hours into work and he was just weed whacking and he slowly started to do worse and worse. And uh, <laughs> at hour four, he told me he had to go fishing with his friend. So he had to leave. So I'm like, all right. <laughs> Couldn't take um, it anymore. He couldn't take it. And, you know, so I, I know people say there's not any talent or, you know, this generations, but I don't think that's true. I think there's plenty of people out there. You just have to find the right people. Agreed. Um, so that'll be a challenge, but. Yeah. So you've been in, in a very disciplined environment. And so what kind of things do you listen to or you do to um, stay sharp and to kind of motivate yourself? Um, let's see. You know, I listen to a podcast. Um, um, it's a tough one. I like to work. I mean, that's kind of my, my hobby, I guess. Um, Cause it just, I can't, I can't sit still very long. Mm -hmm. I have a hard time doing that. So um, I like to spend a lot of time with my family and, you know, take the kids out and do fun stuff. I'm a volunteer T-ball coach. So um, Sweet. I've done, I've done that quite a bit. I, I got, I got it again this year. I don't say I got it like I caught something, but um, it's, uh, you know, it's kind of fun to, to be there for my kids. I know my dad did that when I was younger mm -hmm. too. And, and they actually want you to be around, which is kind of cool. My, 11 year old actually they still like you. yeah they do i don't know uh, they want she wanted me to volunteer to go on her field trip so i'm doing it and like maybe in a, i'll look back in a couple of years and they won't want you around so it's just how things go totally yep i i asked an older gentleman once once what his favorite years were and he said 10 and 11 they're old enough to be fun and talk to and have a relationship with and he goes and they still like you <laughs> <laughs> yep 
Yeah. So um, you listen to podcasts. Do you mostly listen to Mike or do you listen to other business podcasts? Um, so I, I did listen to some of the other green industry mm -hmm. podcasts. Um, and I still do. Um, I just don't enjoy them quite as much. Mm -hmm. I feel like I'm more plugged into the, the Augusta way. Um, and it's still good to, to plug in her, my son. It's I still good it. to, uh, um, to get a different perspective of what's going on with other, um, other companies. Well, it looks like we got cut off here. Probably his little boy bumped something. Yikes. We'll see if he can pop back on here. We'll give him a moment. Pretty phenomenal to hear from a Green Beret who has come into the lawn care industry and running his own business. It's pretty phenomenal. Uh, we are really blessed to have him as a part of Augusta Nation with his discipline and what he brings to the table and solid supporter. You heard him even talking about co-pilot and to, to talk about something that is a huge challenge for us and is right in the beginning of what it's doing. I figured he'd show back up. Sorry about that. That's okay. I figured he probably tapped a button. I, that's what I thought, but I, don't, I honestly don't know what happened. <laughs> <laughs> that's um, a, so you were talking about what you like to listen to. Sure, yeah. You know, some of the other green industry stuff um, and then uh, – I like to listen to Joe Rogan's podcast just because mm -hmm. it's kind of all over the place and yes. uh, it's interesting. Um, I do some books and stuff on um, when I'm mowing and stuff, but after a while I get tired of stuff in my ear. So I'll just put in yeah. my other plugs and not listen to anything. So that's cool. That's cool. So does your little boy think it's pretty awesome what you're doing? Oh yeah. Yeah. He, he enjoys it. We'll go out and, and I'll let him help sometimes. He got him a little bower, uh, battery blower and stuff and, that's sweet. He, he calls us the Mo guys. Yeah, that's pretty cool. <laughs> he probably likes Max too. Yeah, of course. Yeah, that's great. Well, is there anything you'd like to share to other people that are just starting out? There's people that listen that are just in the industry, not planning to join Augusta. And then there, there are those that might be interested. But what would you say to somebody that's just starting out and considering joining? I, as far as that... Um... I couldn't have done it any, any better the way it's gone, you know? And, and I think it, you know, I have my faith. I think God definitely had a, a hand as far as the journey I've taken. Um, but I, after, after joining Augusta and going this route, I just, I wouldn't do any other, other way. Um, but, you know, just if you're not looking to join Augusta and you're just trying to get information, um, just, you know, don't give up. Hard work pays off, you know, um, that, that would probably be my only advice there. That's great. And do you have a quote or anything you'd like to share as we wrap up? Um, what was it? Um, luck favors the prepared. Luck favors the prepared. That's, I didn't, that's not my quote. It's from somewhere else, but. Yeah. Do you think someday pe see people will look at you and say you're so lucky and they'll, they won't know that it was because you were prepared and worked so hard. I'm sure that, you know, uh, five years down the road, some people will be like, oh, how, how did you get that? You know, um, but the people around me and my loved ones will know that there was a lot of hard work and dedication and sacrifice mm -hmm. um, for everybody, not just myself. Mm -hmm. Well, I really appreciate having you a part of the Augusta Nation, like just feel really honored, really, that you'd be a part of what we're doing and believe in us as we are really at the beginning stages. I mean, if we're, we're looking to go to a thousand, we're still in the baby stages of something that we're all going to grow together. And I'm really appreciative that you're a part of that. You'll be such a great influence on others coming behind you. Well, thank you. I, I'm thankful for everything you guys do. I know your, your job is is incredibly difficult and you put a lot of effort into it. So you're taking your time out now, I'm sure um, on your own time to, to do the interview. And um, just, I know you, you have a lot of input as far as um, a good sounding board for, for Mike and, and the rest of the people. Um, so give yourself a pat on the back. I know you put a lot into it. So. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Well, tell your wife, thank you too. I don't know that I got to meet her at the conference. There was just so many. Think so. Yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe the next one, if you guys Absolutely. The next one, I'd love to meet her and tell her thank you, too. Absolutely. Sounds good. All right. Well, I'll let you get back to work. Do you have to go, Mo? Yeah, I have some aerations to do. So. Oh, man. <laughs>
Oh, well, sorry about that. But aeration no, is pretty good money. Yeah, it is. Yeah, so it's worth it. So, yep. all right. Well, I'll let you all go. Right. You have a great day. You too. Thanks, Liz. Thank you.